All right, so good evening, everyone. Today is August the 18th, and I am very pleased to be able to talk to you tonight about how we got the New Testament. So um, I'm going to be using uh, PowerPoint tonight, and um, we'll go through the slides. So as Paul said, um, I'll talk for about 40 minutes, and then, um, then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, I teach biblical languages at the University of Otago, so if you're interested in studying biblical Greek or biblical Hebrew, um, I've got a slide at the end of the presentation that has those course codes. The um, first year language papers start in semester one of each year, so um, it's something maybe to think about for next year if you're interested. Um, this image that I've put up here on the front is an image of Papyrus 72. Um, which is the oldest copy that we have of 1 Peter. So I thought that'd be a nice image to put on the slide um, since 1 um, Peter is my area of research in New Testament studies. So that's a nice picture there of the uh, papyrus. Okay. Okay. So what is the New Testament? So there's gonna be two big questions that we talk about today. So where did it come from? and what's in our modern Bibles. Um, there's kind of two questions. We're gonna talk about the text and we're also gonna talk about translations. So when we're translating something, um, we now have modern editions of the text that have the ancient Greek, but what is actually in, like where does that, where do those actual words come from? And how do we get from, you know, the earliest history of Christianity to what's written there? Um, and then we're also going to talk about translations. So why are they different? Why do we have so many? Um, and, and what are some of the differences between them? And how do we um, begin to think about those? So I think that probably for most uh, people, we know kind of that Jesus lived around uh, roughly 30 AD and uh, was crucified sometime roughly around 30 AD. And um, that's kind of the beginning um, around then is the beginning of Christianity um, uh, as, as, it's, as, it, as, it, as it took off. Um, and we might be able to kind of plot some of the points on that timeline, but then things get really fuzzy when we actually talk about the New Testament. How do we get from Jesus to um, our modern Bibles? If we go into a Christian bookstore today and buy a copy, how do we actually get from Jesus to these modern Bibles? So hopefully today we'll be filling in some of these, um, some of these um, points on the timeline. Okay, so around 30 AD, and some of this um, we probably know, but there's probably um, good to just start at the very beginning. So around 30 AD, um, Jesus had his teaching and ministry. And we don't actually have any <clears throat> papyrus from this time, um, but it's quite possible that maybe some of his followers maybe wrote some of his things down. We don't know. Um, but even if they didn't write anything down, they definitely remembered and they told stories about the things that Jesus said and did. From about the 30s to the 50s, we enter what's known as the tunnel period. And um, New Testament scholars call this the tunnel period because it's like this black tunnel where we don't really have a lot of evidence for what was happening. There must have been a lot happening in the early church, but we don't know a whole lot about the specifics. So we can guess pretty clearly. Pretty, I think pretty fairly, that Christians were telling stories about Jesus. They were telling stories about the preaching of the apostles and their teachings, and they were writing things down. So maybe they were writing down um, um, versions of the gospel. They may have been copying portions from the Hebrew Bible that were important to early Christians. They may have been writing hymns and um, psalms and um, other early Christian documents, things like um, the Lord's Prayer or the Beatitudes or things like that. So they were writing things down and they were preserving and um, developing this oral tradition. But we don't really have the New Testament actually being written as a book or as a document until sometime in the 50s uh, to about the early, uh, very, very beginning of the second uh, century AD. So Paul's writings may be late 40s, uh, early or into the 50s. And then that's kind of when we start seeing um, the other New Testament documents being written as well. Um, potentially some of the latest uh, New Testament documents like 1 Peter and James may have been written in the early second century. It's hard to date some of them. Um, so the first copies of a document, we call those autographs. They're actually written by the person 
um, whose name is associated with them. We don't have any of the autographs of the New Testament, unfortunately, or at least none as far as we know. Um, and presumably these autographs were being copied by Christians, and then they would send copies to other communities and those copies would get copies. So we start this literary process whereby these things are being written and copied. Okay. Um, and so basically things have to be written by hand. And that's pretty much true for the next um, 1,000 and nearly 400 years um, until the time of Gutenberg's printing press. So you can imagine if things are being written by hand, it's a very laborious process, uh, takes a lot of time, and there's always going to be really small, um, small, minute changes that happen during that process. So we tend to think of the end of the age of manuscripts as about um, from basically the first century um, to the uh, 15th century. And so from that point on, from Gutenberg's printing press, then you have a way of standardizing a written text. Um, and so that's really a very definitive moment in um, the history of how we tell the story about where the New Testament came from. Okay, so once we have Gutenberg's uh, text, um, he published a copy of the Latin Vulgate in 1456, which was the Bible in Latin. And then from then, um, we eventually get a copy of the Greek New Testament, which was printed in 1516. Now this was by Froben and Erasmus. There was a little bit of a race on um, among some of the medieval uh, scholars to be the first to publish a Greek New Testament. And so Froben and Erasmus did actually um, get there first. Um, there was another text though that was published in 1624, which was by Elsevier. Um, not the modern Elsevier, interestingly, but the modern Elsevier, I think, does harken back to the, the ancient Elsevier, even though they're not directly related, if you know that big publishing house. Um, and the text that was published by um, Elsevier is called the Textus Re uh, Receptus, and it was influential and used for the next 300 years. So when we're talking about the history of the Greek New Testament, this edition by Elsevier is very, very significant. And so when we talk about the Textus Receptus, um, that's really what we mean. And that was largely, the Textus Receptus was largely the main edition of what we had until Westcott and Hort um, published their edition in 1881 to 1882. And interestingly, this was um, a very significant labor of love on their part. It took them 28 years to really work on this. And um, as we get into this talk, we'll talk about why they spent so long working on this. Okay, um, and then that brings us up to basically the present day. So if you were to enroll in um, Bibs 131, which is the introductory uh, biblical Greek class, the New Zealand Bible Society would provide you with a complimentary copy of the Nestle Allen um, Greek New Testament, which is the ones um, that began um, being printed in the 19th, 20th, um, and now the 21st century. So we actually still use just revised versions of the Nestle Allen. So just that's our kind of thumbnail sketch of the really key um, landmarks in the process of the Greek New Testament. So let's talk about the Textus Receptus. So this was first published in 1516 and it was Erasmus's first Greek New Testament. Now, writing in 1516, uh, Erasmus was based in Basel in Switzerland, and he used the editions of the New Testament that he happened to have. So if you just imagine, um, uh, for, for many of you, you'll remember a time before the internet, but for some of you, this might take some imagination. But before the internet, you really, if you wanted to consult a rare book, you actually had to travel to a different city and um, involved huge amounts of time and money. You'd have to go to Paris or you had to go to London or, or, or Tubian or Germany or, or these places where these um, incredible libraries were, were available. Um, so oh, even until quite recently, travel um, was involved in any type of study of the Greek New Testament if you were doing this manuscript work. So in the 16th century, Erasmus just had to use the copies of the New Testament that were available to him in Switzerland. 
And um, interestingly, um, he did the best with the tools that he had, um, but he actually only had one manuscript of Revelation and it was missing the last page. And so that's not, that's clearly not any type of um, uh, theological statement about the status or the sanctity of the book of Revelation or anything like that. He just literally missed and didn't have a copy of the last page of the book of Revelation. Okay. So his copy of the, his edition of the Textus Receptus was very, very, um, was very, very notable for what it was, but it was still confined to the limitations of the 16th century and the resources that were available to him at the time. Um, in 1624 to 1678, Elsevier is publishing Erasmus's Greek text, um, and it becomes the dominant scholarly edition of the Greek New Testament, um, like I said, for the, le for the next 300 years, basically right up until the um, 19th, excuse me, 19th uh, century. Um, Elsevier's introduction to the book, um, to the edition, contained the phrase received text or textus receptus. And so that's where we get this um, Latin phrase. It means received text. But when we talk about um, Erasmus's edition, that's the received text. Um, some of you um, who have done some church history might recognize the name Erasmus. He was a good friend of Martin Luther. So if you've um, studied the Reformation, studied Luther, you may have come across the name of Erasmus. He was widely respected as a very good scholar um, uh, of his day. So there you go. There you can see um, Textum Receptum. Uh, which is the Latin there. And this is where it helps us to have a little bit of historical perspective about why the Textus Receptus was so important, because it was the addition of the text that was used for a number of very significant New Testament translations into English, okay? Um, also into other languages, so German. So the German Luther Bible used the Textus Receptus. William Tyndale um, used it for his translations of the Bible into English. And the Textus Receptus is actually what is behind the King James Version. Okay, so there are some people that are strong King James only people that believe in basically the, the sanctity of the King James Version. And the reason for that is that they believe that the Textus Receptus, this edition that was produced by Erasmus, was guided by the Holy Spirit. So that's why the King James Version, which is an English translation of it, is so significant and why you can't deviate from it. So it's interesting that they are placing kind of um, that kind of sanctity on this edition that's produced by Erasmus. But like I said, um, Erasmus was a very good scholar, but there were limitations just based on the practical circumstances in which he was working. Um, many of the reform traditions also across Europe use the Textus Receptus, so it was um, a very, very significant addition. With um, this rise of printing, okay, now that you have these editions that were produced by Erasmus, the Textus Receptus, um, you now have all of these printed editions in the, of the Greek New Testament um, across Europe, and scri uh, scribes and scholars are using these. And what's interesting is that these medieval libraries, um, many of them kind of um, hundreds of years old um, and presided over sometimes by monasteries and monks, um, contained many ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. So one of the things that scholars across Europe started doing is comparing the printed editions of the Textus Receptus which with the manuscripts that they had in their libraries, okay? So they were looking at these handwritten editions and comparing them with their printed editions. And suddenly there were these questions that started arising because there would be times where the printed edition didn't exactly match what was in the manuscript. So manuscript is a, um, a name for a handwritten copy of a document rather than a uh, printed copy. So how do you think about these differences? Well, these um, scholars who were Christian um, thought this was a really important question because we're not just talking about any book here, we're talking about the New Testament. So what these questions gave rise to is what we call in biblical studies, the discipline of textual criticism, okay? Which is basically comparing 
different versions of the New Testament or different editions or manuscripts or witnesses and helping us to decide which readings are the most historical um, and which readings maybe explain other readings. So one of the things that New Testament scholars do is they think about how, if, if we come across a particular text that has two different readings in it, has slightly different wording, what are the criteria that we use to decide which one of them is probably older or more original and which one of them's uh, probably younger? And so there's a couple of questions um, that are really helpful here. So for example, we can ask ourselves, which reading could be seen as an ancestor to extant variants? And it's funny, um, it's funny actually, because um, when, I, when I started working on textual criticism, um, the, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, um, scholarly, there's a new scholarly uh, method of, of doing textual criticism, which is called the coherence-based genealogical method or something similar to that. Um, and it's very technical, but the basic method is that we treat manuscripts like genomes. And that if you compare many sets of genomes, you can see family relationships and you can actually trace lineage. And it is kind of funny, I think probably us having this talk on the first day of a level four lockdown due to COVID because suddenly now everybody understands variants <laughs> because the, the way of thinking about these are basically the same way that we think about the genetic profiles of any living creature, um, including, including a virus. Um, but every time you have a, 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 um, a collection of information, whether that's a written document or, or a virus or something, every time it um, reproduces itself or duplicates in a manuscript, this would be every time it is physically copied by hand, there are certain minute changes that happen. And you can actually use computers to trace the relationships of those small changes to trace um, familial and ancestral links. So I think that um, giving this talk today um, with um, 2020 and everything that we've all learned that we're all kind of now um, amateur epidemiologists, this is all language that we all understand, but it's interesting that New Testament scholars are kind of using these same principles to study the New Testament. So we can also we can also ask ourselves which reading is more difficult, right? Because sometimes it, it's easy to understand why a scribe might have come across something that um, he perceived as just being an error, or something that was just maybe grammatically a little bit awkward, and just smoothing it out. Okay, so sometimes the one that's actually more difficult is easier to explain is is easier to kind of think of as more primary because it's um, because, because the other ones that are easier, easier to explain how the changes could have happened if they were intentional. Okay, which reading is shorter? Generally the shorter readings, um, we tend to think of them as being earlier, not always, but often. Um, external evidence is um, important. So how much, how many texts have a particular variant? If we have a single medieval manuscript for a variant, that's not very good evidence. Uh, for it. But if we have many ancient manuscripts that have a reading and they're spread out all over the place, then that's pretty good indication that this happened really early. Um, and again, I think that this, these are all categories that we're um, familiar with thinking through about now because we're thinking about um, series of uh, cycles of transmission, whether that's um, a virus, but the same principles in some ways apply to the texts of the New Testament. Okay, and then finally, internal evidence. What is the theological message of a particular book and how does a particular uh, variant or reading um, cohere with the theological or message that an author is trying to communicate? Um, so these are a little bit more subjective, but they're still very important. Okay. So let's look at some of the actual physical objects that scholars use to do textual criticism. This is an example of what is probably the earliest New Testament man manuscript that we have. It is called Papyrus 52. 
It's called the John Rylands papyrus. Um, and you can see that it's actually very small. So the picture on the left is a close up of it. It's a high resolution image. And the picture on the right is a picture for perspective. Okay, so what's amazing about this is that that entire manuscript, the only part of it that's left is about the size of a credit card. Um, we have enough of the text to identify that this is the New Testament, but we just don't have the whole document. Um, it just didn't survive. Um, this particular papyrus was found by Bernard Grinfell in 1920. It's probably the earliest New Testament manuscript that we have. And it is dated to about 150-ish. And I say ish because um, generally when we're dating these things, we only can be as accurate as about 50 years through uh, various methods. Um, and there's, there's always debate about these. Some people wanna push the date down and be really excited to have a date in the first century. And that would be very exciting. Um, but other people think it's more realistic to see this as about 150. Um, but even if it's 150, it's still a very early copy of the New Testament and it's very exciting to have it. Um, there's another um, important edition of the New Testament, which I like to show my students, which is called Codex Sinaiticus. And this one is really cool because compared to P53, P53 is basically tiny, it's the size of a credit card. Codex Sinaiticus is um, basically a copy of pretty much the entire Bible. It's not exactly what we mean when we talk about the Bible now because um, it does include the apostle, uh, so it does include the apocrypha, um, and it also includes an epistle by Barnabas and the shepherd of Hermas. So those are documents that we don't really include in our Bibles anymore. Um, but by and large, it's, it's largely con contains the books that we call um, the Bible. Um, it was discovered in 1844 by Constantin von Tischendorf. Um, and there's a really kind of funny story that um, Tischendorf tells about this, how he goes to the um, St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, hence the Sinaiticus. And um, he talks about how the monks who lived in this um, monastery were kind of um, just carelessly burning these ancient documents one page at a time. And he very heroically arrives on the scene and saves Codex Sinaiticus from the flames, right? It's very dramatic. Um, and it's probably more dramatic than accurate. <laughs> um, there's probably quite a bit of embellishment going on in, in Tischendorf's version of the story. Um, in all likelihood, the monks probably knew that they had something very ancient and something very valuable and worthy of preservation. Um, and Tischendorf um, somehow manages to convince them to let him um, take the manuscript away with him um, for, for better or worse. Okay, so if we look at a page of Codex Sinaiticus, um, we can see that the handwriting is laid out in these columns. Um, sometimes there's these things that are written in the side, kind of almost as paragraph markers. Um, and this thing is actually huge. Um, so if you imagine each page, um, you know, being almost probably, um, I don't even, I'm not even sure how you would measure it, but bigger than a dinner plate or um, kind of one of those place, bigger than a place setting that you would have at a table. It's, it's very, very large and it's very, very heavy. So this is a page um, from the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and there's a close-up of it there. Okay, so when scholars um, are working on the Greek New Testament today, they will be working on it from an edition called the Nestle Allen, generally speaking, um, and they'll be using the Novum Testamentum Graeche. And the Novum Testamentum Graeche um, published by the Bible Society. It is the closest scholarly approximation to the earliest form of the New Testament. So this means that scholars from around the world have been studying all of the available manuscript evidence that we have and comparing every single reading of all of that evidence to try to determine what are the most likely um, forms of the books. So 
the NA28 now, is because it's in its 28th edition, is this closest scholarly approximation to the earliest form of the New Testament. And as that name 28 suggests, it's gone through 28 editions because um, new editions of the New Testament are always being discovered, which is very exciting. So if we think back to poor Erasmus in Basel, he didn't even have a single complete copy of the book of Revelation. Okay, now scholars today through the internet and through um, these types of scholarly enterprises have access to hundreds of copies of ancient editions of the New Testament, ancient manuscripts, um, early editions of the New Testament in other languages. And all of that evidence is studied and sifted very carefully to um, determine um, the earliest form of the New Testament. So um, it's very labor intensive work, but the people who do it are very, very passionate about it. And the reason why it keeps coming out in new editions is because of the discovery of new evidence. So theoretically, if there was some discovery in the desert of Egypt where somebody dug up a cache of ancient documents, including a bunch of letters, um, maybe we could find the original uh, Second Corinthians, right? The letter of tears, you know, maybe there's always a chance that these documents still exist somewhere. Um, then, of course, um, all of that evidence is used to study the New Testament. Um, we can always hope um, that there's new discoveries that are waiting to be made. Um, the Novum Testamentum Graeci also uses a standard methodological approach to using manuscripts and witnesses. And so scholars have tried to be as transparent as possible about why they're making the decisions that they're doing and that their decision-making process and their results are all open to kind of scholarly peer review and scholarly evaluation. Okay, so what they're trying to do is not be motivated by kind of a personal preference or particular doctrine, doc, um, doctrinal um, commitments, but by the actual evidence that's there. Okay, so that's kind of how we get to um, the modern printed editions of the Greek New Testament. So why then do we need so many different New Testament translations in English? Okay, there's a couple of different reasons why we have so many English translations. And one of them is that the source text that's used is a different source text. So what exactly is being translated from Greek into English? And we've seen this a little bit, uh, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but we'll come back to it. We also have differences of translation technique or the purpose of the translation. And I think it's important to say with this, that there's no, there's kind of a spectrum here of options and there's not a perfect translation. There's just different approaches to how we um, use the text. Um, and then finally, um, language itself changes, so English changes. So um, there's need sometimes to have a new text that reflects the language that people actually use. And there's also sometimes there's uh, nuances or ambiguities in Greek. And sometimes you actually need multiple translations to try to bring out what's actually there in the Greek. Um, textual variants, we've seen that sometimes um, translation committees will actually um, disagree with other translation committees about whether or not to include certain variants and things like that. So that can affect them as well. So let's talk about, let's talk about the texts that are actually used. So if we look at these um, four items, one, two, three, and four, translated from different texts. Okay, so given the history that we've covered now, you now have an idea about what the Textus Receptus is. Okay, the Textus Receptus, um, for all of its strengths and weaknesses, is the Greek text that was used to translate the Tyndale Bible in 1530, the King James Version in 1611, and also later the Authorized Version, and the New King James Version, um, which came out in 1982. Okay, so there's a clear kind of lineage to these translations because they're all descended from the Textus Receptus. Okay. However, if we compare that to more modern editions that are translated from the Nestle Allen, and remember using all of this, um, all of the manuscript resources and um, tools that were available, 
we have a different set of translations, which are things like um, the NIV, the NLT, the ESV, and, and pretty, and as far as I know, the, the vast majority of other Bible translations will use the Nestle Allen. Okay, so the text that they're using to translate can actually divide some of these um, English translations up into different categories. So that's why there's a really big difference in some ways between the NIV um, and King James. I mean, that and the fact that the NIV was done quite recently and the King James was done in 1611. So, so you know, King James was great using what it had at the time, but now we have better stuff, and so we should be using the better stuff. Okay, now let's talk about just translation strategy. Um, again, there's not really a right or wrong answer here. It depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to have a very literal translation, um, you might end up with language that is stiffer, not as elegant, but trying to preserve very accurately what's there in the Greek or the Hebrew. And we tend to see that things like the English Standard Version, the Literal Standard Version, and the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, they try to be as literal as possible. Okay. And at the other end of the spectrum, we get things that are um, what we call kind of dynamic equivalents. So the tra translators aren't focused on kind of trying to be as literal as possible. They're trying to translate the sense of what something means. And so sometimes they can be a little bit more paraphrastic. They can paraphrase rather than being strictly translating the individual words. And so this would be things like the living Bible or the message or things like that. And most um, English translations will be somewhere on that spectrum between formal equivalence uh, and dynamic equivalence. Okay. So let's just have a look here at um, how some of these different translations handle this. So this is an example from John 1.5. Um, and we'll just look at why these English translations are different. So you can see the Greek there at the top. Um, but if you um, want to see some of the English translations, let's go over some of those. So the new revised standard version, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Okay, did not overcome it. Let's compare that to the NIV. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay, so it's interesting. They're kind of making a slim, some kind of has not overcome it. There's a kind of, there's a subtle difference there. The light, now notice the NASB here, the light has capitalized light because they really want to emphasize that this is, um, that we're speaking about the second person of the Trinity here, that this is a divine figure, right? So they've, they've tried to make that clear by highlight, by, by making the um, light capitalized. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Okay, so notice that now they've translated the Greek with comprehend, and there's quite a difference between overcoming and comprehending, right? So if you were comparing these in English, they would look very different, and they, they do give a different sense about what kind of claim the text is making. King James, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. ASV, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness apprehended it not. Okay, and the message, of course, this is our paraphrase, the life light blazed out of the darkness and the darkness couldn't put it out, right? Not trying to be literal, but trying to kind of give something, something else, something more of a paraphrase here. Okay, so is any of these a perfect translation or why are they different and how do we interpret these differences? Is this a textual problem or is this some other kind of issue? What's going on with all of these different um, examples? And so we're just gonna talk about this as a way of explaining why some of these English translations are so different. So if you knew a little Greek, you could look up the verb here, which is katalambano. And the big dictionary of ancient Greek is called BDAG. So let's say you wanted to know what does katalambano actually mean? And BDAG says to make something one's own, win or attain, okay? Gain control of someone through pursuit, catch up with or seize, um, seize with a hostile intent, 
take over um, and come upon. And this is the one that BDAG um, identifies as being relevant to John 1, 5. To come upon someone with implications of surprise or to catch. And then finally, to process information, understand, or grasp. Okay, so what's really interesting here is that this single Greek verb can actually have all of these meanings. And the u there, u katalaban, means um, not. So the darkness did not katalaban the light. The darkness didn't win, didn't attain the light. The darkness didn't seize the light. The darkness didn't surprise or catch, or the darkness didn't understand or grasp the light. Okay, it's interesting that all of these nuances are possible with this one verb. Okay, so if we go back and look at these examples that we have in English, these English translations in their various ways are having to choose between one of the various meanings of kata lambano, right? Kata lambano, as we've seen, can have these four different meanings in Greek. But when we translate that into English, we have to pick a single one. And it's quite possible that the author of John meant kata lambano, and he wanted it to have multiple meanings. It's like maybe it's possible that the darkness didn't overcome the light, but also that the darkness didn't understand the light. And in Greek, it's possible that there's a word play that both of those are relevant, but only one of them that can be translated into English at any one time, okay? So it's possible here, for example, that there's a little bit of richness in the Greek that it's just impossible to bring into the English. So this isn't a fault, per se, with any of the English translations, it's just an example of differences between languages and some of the limitations that you have when you're translating. Okay. Um, I think that we're gonna skip this example here. Um, and so let's just talk about textual variants. Okay, so um, if you um, are involved in churches or ministry or things like that, and people um, ask you about the validity of the New Testament, you know, can we even trust the New Testament if it was copied so many times and that there are these variants? You know, can we even still trust the New Testament? Okay, so in very broad strokes, um, here's, here's, um, here are some responses, that the vast majority of textual variants are very, very minor. They're minor spelling differences where you even have the same word that's spelled just a couple of different ways or their um, variations in writing and that they are completely inconsequential to the meaning, okay? Um, after that, kind of there's a smaller subset where we do have some interesting variants that are diverse, that are just a little different, um, but are not controversial, okay? So maybe the way that someone is identified is slightly different, but it doesn't change who they are or what they say or anything like that. They're just kind of very slight minor differences. And then there's this very final category where we do have a few significant textual variants, okay? This is definitely the smallest category, but there are some um, variants in the New Testament that are, do have some significant theological issues involved. But I would say that even for those, um, we don't have to be threatened by them, I think was probably the most important thing. Um, that we can talk about them, we can study them, we don't have to feel that they're going to threaten um, our view of the New Testament, okay? So if you're interested in this topic, I would highly recommend um, uh, Elijah Hickson and Peter uh, Gary's book, uh, Myths and Mistakes in New Testament Textual Criticism. This is an absolutely fabulous book. Um, it came out in 2019, so it has got very up-to-date information on New Testament textual criticism. And the people, um, so um, we have the editors here, Hickson and Gary, and largely they're both evangelicals, interestingly, and um, most of the essays and chapters in the book are written by evangelicals because they don't like, because basically textual criticism, if you've kind of been getting the impression now from this talk, is a very technical subdiscipline within biblical studies that takes um, a high degree of specialized training to do. And their um, mission is that 
they've studied, the people that have written these essays have studied textual criticism and they want to do um, different types of um, uh, apologetics that are, ba that are fact based on facts and information. And they just, um, they're unhappy with some apologetics work that is unintentionally in most cases, um, just factually incorrect or outdated. Okay, so the book is um, for people that wanna do this kind of stuff, but want the most up-to-date accurate information. Um, the other thing is that there's information out there on the New Testament that's now just outdated and old and that people that want to talk intelligently about the New Testament shouldn't be using the old information anymore. So there's a whole there's a whole discussion, interestingly, to be had there. So if you're interested, I'd encourage you to read the book. So here's what um, one of the editors says. Is the Bible's inspiration a moot point because the original text is lost in the mists of time? Or do we have nothing to worry about because our modern edition, um, our modern editions match the original text in 99% of cases? Okay, so here's what he says. In this chapter, so this is the, one of the first chapters of the book, we will show why both claims are overstated. In the first case, it is true that a large majority of our vast number of variants really are trivial for modern Bible readers. But we also hope to show why giving the impression that no variants matter for Christian doctrine gives an equally false impression. Okay, so they're saying that there actually are some variants that matter um, and we should take them seriously. Okay, um, I think that I will go through this very quickly, but I'll just explain to you one that's one variant that I, I think is a good illustration of this. Um, this is a, an actual page of the Nestle Allen. It's the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. And you can see here that there's square brackets around this set of words, which is we use we use um, and the reason for that is because it's not clear if those words are supposed to be there at the beginning of Mark or if they're added in. What it means is that some witnesses have those words and other witnesses don't. So are they supposed to be there or not? Okay, here's, an, here's just a, um, a sampling of, of um, English translations. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, okay? And so those English translations do have the phrase son of God, okay? Um, I'm gonna skip through some of this because I think that we're running a little bit late on time, okay? Um, but there's a whole discussion here about, about this. Um, okay, so what, do we, what would we have to ask ourselves? What's at stake if, about whether or not those words are there. So it's whether I think, I think that this is about whether the author of the gospel of Mark is telling us who Jesus is at the beginning or not, okay? And it's interesting that if he's telling us that at the beginning, it means that he is the evangelist wants the reader to read the entire gospel knowing that from the very beginning, okay? Um, it doesn't mean that if the words aren't there, he doesn't believe that Jesus is the son of God, right? Because the entire gospel, I'd say, is going on to show that Jesus is the son of God. It would just change the way the narrative is understood that um, this is something that unfolds through the process of the gospel if the words aren't there, rather than something that the readers told at the beginning. So even in that example, which I'd say is theologically significant, it's not something that would um, indicate that the evangelist didn't think Jesus was the son of God if the words aren't there. Okay, I tend to think that the weight of evidence supports the reading being there, um, but if, if it did turn out the other way, uh, that wouldn't, um, that would just change the way that we have to read Mark a little bit, but it wouldn't change the theological claims that Mark is making in his overall gospel. Okay. Okay, so we can have a pretty um, high confidence in the reliability of modern English translations of the New Testament um, and also in the textual editions that we have of the Greek New Testament. Um, and a careful study of the Greek text of the New Testament is both challenging and rewarding, okay? So um, it's kind of like walking, a, it's kind of finding the balance there between saying that we can be confident in this 
but it's also a deeply rewarding thing to study and has its challenges and nuances that we need to kind of respect and appreciate on their own terms. Okay, so there's a lot of really thing, um, things that are very interesting in the study of the Greek New Testament, um, both academically um, and spiritually, um, and it's very, very rewarding. Um, so I hope that maybe you might be interested a little bit in um, maybe studying Greek or Hebrew next year. So in semester one, uh, we offer Bibs 131, which is introductory, introductory New Testament Greek, and Hebrew 131, which is the introductory biblical Hebrew. Um, and if you're interested in some of the things that I've talked about today, um, these are some of the books that I would recommend. Okay, so the text of the New Testament from Manuscript to Modern Edition by J. Harold Greenlee. There's the Myths and Mistakes in New Testament Textual Criticism, which is that kind of um, purple and orange book that I showed you. And there's a couple other um, things there. If you're interested in, um, yeah, so those books, those books um, are, are worth reading and are very helpful. Okay, so I think that that will um, uh, conclude my talk. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the recording off and then I'd be happy to take your questions.